Welcome back this Sunday night. Welcome to those of you who are here. And we want to welcome those who are live streaming as well. I'm assuming we have some doing, doing that. Uh, I know my wife is at home. Uh, the knee is still bothering her, so keep praying for her if you would. And others with COVID, we have a number of folks. Uh, I don't know what the tally is as far as number-wise, but I know we just kept getting phone calls. We've been diagnosed with Larry and Carolyn Carlson, as you might need to be aware. So be in prayer for them and, and others uh, uh, recovering. And so we're glad you're here tonight and glad for those who are live streaming and our choir and orchestra, of course. stand please as we sing our first congregational song an old gospel song some glad morning when this life is o'er I'll fly away you join me let's sing together some glad morning when this life is o'er song I'll fly away and we will the days of our years of three score and ten and if by reason of strength they be four score yet is there strength labor and sorrow and then we soon fly away all right uh, Dave take this Pastor Steinhouse take this to him and will you lead us in prayer we're going to bring the microphone back to you and uh, have you lead us I hope you've come with an open heart for what God has for you tonight wonderful look forward to hearing uh, C.T. Spear, our evangelist preacher, uh, for us tonight. All right, Brother Stein, I'll lead us in prayer. Please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to Thee this evening re relying upon Thy grace and Thy mercy for us for each and every day. And Lord, as we come together as a body of believers, we ask that You would just speak to each heart and that through the preaching of Thy Word that we may grow and that we may be, take that from thy word and use for the situations that we're in. Lord, I pray for the music and for the uh, special music and all that takes place in these services, that it would be done for your glory and for your honor. And now we ask for your 
presence, and Lord, that uh, we know that you're here, and Lord, that we would be conscious of the working of the Holy Spirit in our life, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you, choir and orchestra. Thank you, Hannah, for the solo. God is good to us, far beyond what we deserve. There are his blessings on us every day. God's leading in our life. I love this song that I'm going to ask you to stand and sing. It's entitled, God Leads Us Along. It has four verses, so we're going to do a couple of verses back to back, a chorus, and then two more verses in the chorus. You join me, let's sing together. 
in shady green pastures so rich and so sweet god leads his dear children along where the water's cold flow bays the weary ones feet god leads his dear children along sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley in darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children along through grace. And conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Away from the mire and away from the clay, God leads his dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity's day. God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. In the night season and all the day long. Thank you for singing and please be seated. Sometimes the path is steep, the water's deep, the way seems hard and long. Sometimes we wonder why we question if his word has led us wrong. Don't get stuck in a rut, you gotta look up. Turn from worry. Yeah. 
right, thank you, young people. Appreciate that. What a message in that song. Don't forget Heritage Builders tomorrow evening, 6 p.m. in our uh, Family Life Center. We're going to be having that concert, so come and join us for that. Meal begins at 6 and then the concert afterwards. Tonight, following the evening service, just wanted to invite all the students in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade and their families right in the Family Life Center for our snack. We'll have some Papa John's pizza, some Mario Kart, other games, some big ball volleyball. Um, Miss Danielle helped me inflate the thing, and she pushed it at me. It was chasing me. I had to, like a certain archaeologist kind of like let it roll over me. Five feet in diameter. It's going to be a great time. Um, just right after church, the FLC. If you've never seen big ball volleyball, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome to behold. Um, Saturday, January 29th, we have a young couple's baby shower uh, from 2 to 4 in the FLC. Ladies will be doing baby shower stuff. Guys will be playing basketball. That's for the 20s and 30s class. And then on February the 1st, we have a very cool opportunity for a men's prayer breakfast. We had one this past Saturday. It went very well. It was very encouraging. Great fellowship. Great food. Thank you, Ms. Glada, and your help uh, for putting that together. Uh, that's going to be from 6 to 7. So we changed the time from 5.30 to 6.30 to 6 to 7. That's Tuesday on February 1st. I encourage you, uh, men, on always to pray and not to faint. I encourage you to come if you can. And then on February 4th, our sweetheart banquet. All couples welcome. $10 per couple catered meal in the FLC. I hope to see you there. We've got a lot of things going on that um, are just exciting and will be good for you. And so if you have any questions, you can see any of us. Uh, there's sign-up sheets in the foyer, or you can check the church bulletin or church website. Thank you. All right. Some wonderful things going on here in days ahead as this uh, new year starts flying by, doesn't it? Already it's uh, moving along. Uh, let me encourage you about the new member visitor's luncheon next uh, Sunday afternoon, right after the service. We... Uh, want to welcome all the new members that we have, help them to feel welcome. We haven't had one of these since last year, uh, so we, we want to get on with that so we can give you some valuable information and get you and your family plugged into the different ministries that go on here that you may not be aware of. So that's immediately following the service next uh, Sunday morning, following the 1030 service. And, of course, you've heard all the other announcements. God bless you for your faithfulness. Now, I know that... Uh, you know, this time last year, I always look at, uh, I always look at last year how things were going. Last year, I don't believe the choir was even singing at this time last year. It wasn't. Uh, I didn't think so. We weren't having the Bible study hour last year. Uh, just a meeting uh, on Sunday morning, Sunday night, just with a handful of folks. So we are doing better. But this resurgency, of course, uh, and this uh, Omicron, whatever you call it, a variant has uh, certainly affected folks, and they, it is seemingly much more contagious. More people are coming down with it, but uh, we pray that God will help you and strengthen you, and uh, that we'll get past this, and maybe, maybe we will say uh, so long, uh, soon, <laughs> and uh, good riddance, and uh, don't ever come back again, and the welcome light's not on, <laughs> you know, all those kind of things you may say to a, a real, I mean a relative, but... Uh, you know, so uh, we uh, want to uh, encourage you about this. Uh, man, I don't, the Spanish flu back 100 years ago, no one ever hears of the Spanish flu, which uh, killed, uh, we understand, uh, literally uh, hundreds of thousands. And so we're praying that we can get past this so we can, you know, it's been like up and down like a yo-yo, but we're praying that God will continue to help us in a mighty way. We thank God for your faithful giving, and here's another opportunity to do so whether online or here in the service. Let's stand together, shall we, Rick? What are we singing? All right, as we prepare to give tonight, let's sing through this chorus. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome, and certainly we welcome the Spirit of the Lord in our service. You join me and let's sing. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place omnipotent father of mercy and grace thou art welcome in this place all right john lopez come and lead us in prayer would you Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for 
the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, on a cross for our sins. We thank you we can come before you to worship you uh, in our singing. And now, as we prepare to give back to you, I ask that you would uh, bless this offering, bless the giver, and that uh, what is given will be used for your honor and your glory. Help us to be faithful stewards uh, for what you give to us, and that uh, we give you the first fruits, knowing that you are worthy of everything. Father, again, we thank you for who you are and your love for us. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
All right, Mackenzie, thank you very much. What a great song and beautifully done, and I pray that uh, you will always use that great voice God has blessed you with for his honor and his glory. And thank you, thank you, all of you, the choir and orchestra and special music, offertory, everything here tonight. All the kids, all the boys and girls up through the uh, fifth grade, you're welcome to go. We have class uh, just for you uh, out in the back. God bless you. You know, for many years I had heard uh, the name C.T. Spear and him uh, preaching all along up in the northwest Colorado area and uh, further around the western states, but uh, our paths never had much of an opportunity to cross, as sometimes that's the way it is with preachers. Um, and then uh, when we, we took a trip together in the Holy Land, you and your son-in-law, and so we uh, got better acquainted. And then I found out that his their son married a girl that used to that grew up here in our church, uh, Aaron Love, and uh, so we had a connection there. And then they moved uh, to this area and joined the Temple Baptist Church. And we're glad to be a supporter of their ministry, the Hourglass Ministry, and a greatly used evangelist. And I'm looking forward to hearing what God has laid on his heart. Give him a good hand as he comes. Brother Spear, God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 13. I'll give you a moment or two to find that. I enjoyed that, that solo so much. It reminded me of when I was about that age. I leaned over to the pastor and asked, how old is she? <laughs> that was because when I was, a, when I was a teenager, my pastor would ask me to, to sing. I, actually, what happened was that... Uh, I started out and I took piano lessons for three years and can't play Peter, Peter, Pumpkin Eater. And uh, so I quit that and then they uh, got me uh, trombone lessons and I, I joined the band and I played the trombone for a while, badly. <clears throat> the Sunday school superintendent used to call up and he'd say, uh, would you uh, be willing to uh, play your glorified plumbing for the Sunday school opening? <laughs> and uh, this is a small church in western Nebraska, Scotts, or Mitchell, Nebraska, town of about 1,900 population. We lived out in the country about five, six miles out, out, out away from there. So he would call up and he'd say, uh, uh, you, uh, you want to play your glorified plumbing? And uh, so I would get up. I'd practice and practice and practice. I never could figure out how to play a whole song without making at least one or more mistakes. And I was so embarrassed every time. So one day he called and said, would you like to play your glorified plumbing next Sunday for Sunday school uh, opening? And I said, Mr. Walker, would it be okay if I just sing instead? And I sang that Sunday and they never asked me to play any instrument ever again. <laughs> but I had another problem and that was that every time I got up to sing, my Adam, I, I, I don't know what, to, what you call this, there's probably a technical term for it, Brother, brother uh, uh What's your name? Brother Rick. <laughs> Brother Rick probably knows what this is called, but when, you're, when you involuntarily swallow your Adam's apple, like that, it, it makes a terrible noise, and it's really bad, especially when you're sing, trying to sing a note and hold the note, you know, <clears throat> and it usually happens on a word like amazing grace, like that. And so <clears throat> that happened to me over and over again, and I determined I was not gonna, I was not gonna sing anymore. <clears throat> so then my pastor would have me come up. He, he'd say, "Okay, now we're gonna have uh, Lloyd Spear come up." They called me Lloyd back in those days. I finally got rid of that too. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, he would have me come up, and <clears throat> he would already have the music there. He'd already have the pianos plugged in, and I had no choice but to have to sing. He just kept doing that to me until I finally overcame whatever it was that made me <coughs> right in the middle of the song. Well, I hope you found 2 Kings chapter 13. I want to speak to you tonight on the opportune moment. The opportune moment. <clears throat> I guess I've kind of had the ep Epsi Gazook the last few days. How many of you have ever heard of the Epsi Gazook? <clears throat> Nobody's heard of the Epsi Gazook. My granddad used to talk about the Epsi Gazook, and it was something pretty bad whenever you get the Epsi Gazook, you know. And so <clears throat> then one day, many years went by, I never ever heard anybody ever, anyone else ever use the term Epsi Gazook <clears throat> until one day I was reading a sermon of Billy Sunday. 
and Billy Sunday started talking about a horse disease called the epizootic. And I said, I think I know where the Epsi gazoot came from. Because <laughs> my granddad was just a joker. Well, <clears throat> this is a story in 2 Kings chapter 13. This is a story about a king and his bow and arrow. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth, I know just where. While aiming at a buck afar, I pierced the radiator of my car. <laughs> but actually, there is a better version. I sneezed a sneeze. This goes better with Epsi Gazoot. I sneezed a sneeze into the air. It fell to earth, I know just where. For hard and cold were the looks of those in whose vicinity I snows. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 13, we better get to it, hadn't we? 2 Kings chapter 13, and we're going to just read a section here. There's, I'll refer to a couple other verses just, uh, just to give us some anchor points along the way. But I want to just read this short story out of the life of Elisha, beginning in verse 14 of 2 Kings chapter 13. Now Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take now bow, or take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said unto the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians from in effect till they have consumed them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice, one, two, three, and stayed. He stopped. The man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died. And they buried him and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. Lord, guide our thoughts, I pray. In Jesus' name. When I was 25 years old, I was a staff member in a church, and the pastor said to me, uh, you know, you ought to learn how to fly. I said, yeah, sure. He said, no, I'm a certified flight instructor, and I'd be glad to give you lessons to learn how to fly. He said, all you have to do is pay for the fuel. <laughs> well, that was okay, but I had just started a, uh, a degree program at a seminary, and somehow I thought getting that degree was more important than learning about how to fly. I might have better judgment about that now. <laughs> but uh, so I passed by, I, I passed up the opportunity to fly, but it was the opportune moment for me. I've never had an opportunity like that again. You know, life really does present to us some opportune moments. Uh, for actually for every person, for every family, for every organization. This story is about Joash's opportune moment. <clears throat> now there's a little difficulty with Joash. There are actually six men in the Bible named Joash. <laughs> So it's kind of hard to figure out which Joash you're talking about unless you pay attention while you're reading. This man named Joash is actually the king of Israel. When I say Israel, I'm talking about the northern ten tribes of Israel. You see, after the reign of Solomon, his son became king. His name was Rehoboam. And Rehoboam made a, made a bad mistake of listening to the young guys who said, Increase the taxes! And he did, and as a result, he split the kingdom. 
Result was the ten northern tribes became a kingdom on their own, and Rehoboam was left with just the two southern tribes, the, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Well, <clears throat> King, King Joash here, this King Joash, is the guy who had those ten northern tribes. And most of the kings of the ten northern tribes, usually referred to in the Bible as Israel, those, those kings were all idolaters. Almost every one of them were wicked men. Um, we're talking about people like Jeroboam. The Bible over and over again says, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Or Ahab, you all know about Je Ahab and Jezebel, right? Ahab was one of those kings. And this guy, Joash, is in the line of succession following Jeroboam and Ahab and other wicked kings. He was a Baal worshiper, but here's the good thing about him. He had a little bit of respect for Elisha, the prophet, the man of God. I guess that's kind of like in our country. We've had a lot of wicked rulers. But it's also true that a lot of them had respect for religious leaders, men of God. They would have conferences with men of God. J. Frank Norris, who was in, in uh, Fort Worth, was often called to consult with Harry Truman. We all know about Billy Graham and his consultations with many presidents. Jerry Falwell was respected that way. But it's not enough just to have respect for the man of God. Hear me now. It's not enough to have respect for the man of God. We need to listen carefully with our heart to his guidance. I want you to notice with me three features of this story. And the first one is this. I want you to see with me the impending invasion. Now, this is an invasion that was on its way to happen it's really not an invasion. It was several invasions. Look with me at verse 17, uh, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see it again. He said, open the window eastward, and he opened it, and Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite Syria in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. So we know that Syria was one of the enemies that was right on the border. I never understood the lay of the land until I got to go to Israel with the pastor. <clears throat> and my, my daughter and son-in-law raised the money for me to go. I always thought, well, I'll never, I, I, I don't have the money to do that, and I always put it off. I should have made it a priority earlier in my life, but I got to go. While we were there, <clears throat> we went up on, on a high place by the Sea of Galilee, called the Golan Heights. Now, I'd heard about the Golan Heights in the news. I knew that it was a contested piece of ground, but I never really understood why, and that's because I did all of my searching in these maps in the back of my Bible. You know what I mean? I don't know about you, but all these maps in the back of my Bible are flat. Aren't yours flat? They're just flat. And that doesn't show you that there are some pretty high places and some pretty low places over there. We took that bus up onto the, up on the Golan Heights, and man, we were looking down on the Sea of Galilee, and they began to explain to us right over the top of this hill is where Syria is. To this day, Syria is a problem for Israel. Well, there were other enemies as well. Look with me at verse 19. The man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Till then thou hadst smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. If we were to go back into the previous passage in the verses, uh, oh, verses about 10 through uh, 13, you'll see that there's a man there named Jehoash. That's actually the same guy, Joash. 
It's just a different spelling of his name. Jehoash is, is mentioned a couple of times there. And if you read through that section, it also talks about two other enemies that, were, that they were facing. They were facing the fact that up here in the northern area of Israel, the Golan Heights were, were a place where they were looking down. You could look down on the Sea of Galilee. Out of the Sea of Galilee flows the Jordan River down into the Dead Sea. <clears throat> and up, up here on this, on this high place, on the other side, is Syria. And man, they, they just love to attack off of that mountain. And all of a sudden, I understood exactly why the people of Israel to this day want to maintain control of the Golan Heights. Well, there was another problem. Assyria was a bigger country and a more powerful military power that was located, we'll say, if this was a map of Israel, it would be located way over there in the back of the choir. And they were... They were threatening also. They were not threatening Israel so much as they were threatening to attack Syria. But sure enough, if they attack Syria, the next thing they're going to do is come and attack Israel. And then there was another problem, and that was there was another neighbor that was just over on the other side, on the other side of Jordan, called Moab, the descendants of Lot. And the Moabites were descending. Remember that last verse that we read in verse 20? Elisha died and they buried him and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land in the coming in of the year. <clears throat> Moab had been defeated 60 years before this event took place. 60 years. Elisha was about 90 years old when this event took place. He became a preacher. He became a a prophet of God when he was around 30 years of age. So that means he was about 90. And for 60 years he had been preaching. He had been prophesying to Israel. He had followed, he had been trained by and followed the leadership of Elijah. And now there's an impending invasion from three different sources. Well, you know, I guess we can draw some parallels, and maybe we don't need to draw too many, but I do want you to think about the invasions that seem to be impending upon our own lives, our own country, yeah. our own families, our own church. I was reading an article, <clears throat> just comes out one, I think about once a month I get this little magazine that's a free magazine called Imprimus. It comes from Hillsdale College where Lauren uh, Scott is going go to go to college. I want to read you a little excerpt from the president of the college who wrote these words in the March-April 2020 edition of Imprimus. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, was created in 1942 as the Office of National Defense Malaria Control Activities, and in 1946 was renamed the Communicable Disease Center. For many decades, it focused on the original mission, viruses and communicable diseases. But in the, 20, in the 2000s, the CDC, like most executive agencies, had become largely independent of political control and lost its focus. It widened its work to include chronic diseases and addictions, nutrition, school health, injuries, and racial and ethnic approaches to community health. In the years since, reports document multi-million dollar CDC studies on topics like the prevention of gun violence, how parents should discipline children, and chronic health conditions. President Arn, who wrote the article, President Larry Arn of Hillsdale College, pointed out that an architect may not be an expert bricklayer, but he sees the big picture. The final product, better than any brick mason or plumber or electrician. And it seems to me that for too long we've elected a lot of plumbers to run the project. That's not all. We've elected kids to lead our families. 
And that's not all either. We've elected consensus to lead our churches. And thank God this church is not like that. A few years ago, a book came out. It became very popular, probably the most popular Christian book over a couple of year period, written by a preacher in California. The way to find out what you're supposed to preach is hand out cards and ask people what they want to hear. You know that, preacher? That's what you're supposed to do. Aren't you glad we don't have a preacher who does that? Aren't you glad that we have a man of God who gets on his face before God and opens the word of God and says, Dear God, give me a message for my people. That brings me really to the second feature of this story, and that is the vanishing influence. There was this impending invasion, but now comes the vanishing influence that we want to consider, and this is this dying prophet who is 90 years old, and if the Reese Chronological Bible is correct, and I think it's probably pretty close, this man was only going to live. Elisha was only going to live about another year after this incident. Of course, nobody knew that. We all think that People are going to live forever, you know, and we don't plan on their departure. Elisha was an unusual preacher. Trained by Elijah, he had asked for God to give him a double portion of Elijah's spirit. The result was that he was as used of God as Elisha and perhaps doubly so. Miracles took place. He raised a child from the dead. He healed a leper. There were so many things. In his first year, he prophesied the defeat of Moab, the enemy of Israel. And it happened. And by the way, Moab never tried to attack again for 60 years. Now the old man is talking to the young king. He tells him, take these arrows and shoot these arrows. He didn't tell him how many arrows to shoot, how many times to shoot. He just told him to shoot. Shoot! And he shot. The Bible says that he shot, apparently shot three times. I'm not sure exactly how to interpret and understand this passage. I've read it and I've studied it and I've looked up what other men say. I sort of have a hunch that the Bible is saying that, that he told him to take the arrows in his hand and to smite with the arrows, and maybe he just held a batch of arrows and, and smote on the ground. One, two, three, like as if to say, okay, bam, bam, bam. Is that good enough? And what he didn't realize was he was revealing a heart attitude. And I want to come to the third feature the trifling idolater. If you'll jump back to verse 11, we'll read about this man, Joash. He's in, in verse 10 and 11, he's referred to as Jehoash. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not from the, all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, and he walked therein. See, when the, when the kingdom split, Jeroboam took that northern kingdom and he knew that if he let his people keep going down to Jerusalem, they were going to want to get back together with, the, with that other kingdom. It was just inevitable that it was going to happen. And so he said, we'll set up new worship centers. We'll go up here to the north and we'll set up a worship center in Dan. We'll set up down near Jerusalem. We'll set up at the town of Bethel. We'll set up a worship center there. And those worship centers were for Baal worship, worshiping golden calves. Now, I'm not going to try to get into all that is implied in the Baal worship and the golden calves, but I'm just going to say it this way. It was a very pornographic type of worship. And our country has been sliding ever farther into the same kind of thinking 
we are probably a lot farther along than most of us really understand. He was an idolater. And I want to think about this trifling idolater. Look with me at verse 14. Now, Elijah was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died, and Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him, and he wept over his face. Now, that sounds like a guy who's pretty sincere and earnest, doesn't it? I can't tell you that those were fake tears. I don't know that for sure. But notice he says, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That is a direct quote of something that Elisha had said when Elijah was taken up. You know, Elijah never died. Uh, the, chariot of, the chariot of God came down and took Eli, Elijah up and, and, and Elijah was standing there watching when he went up. I mean, you're talking about the rapture of the church and the time when Jesus is going to come and call us away. That's the kind of thing that happened and Elisha saw it happen. And when it happened, Elisha said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He knew that it, God had sent that flaming chariot to take his mentor away. Well, you'll have to decide for yourself. But I personally believe that Joash was sentimental, not spiritual. I believe that he was probably more worried about the media reports about his little visit with the famous preacher. I think that he was nostalgic, not repentant. And that's why he went in there prepared to rehearse Elisha's oft-told story. Can you imagine? In 60 years of preaching, well, you follow me around, you hear me say the same, ask my wife. She's heard me tell the same stories probably hundreds of times. Because there are certain stories, especially if you travel and you have an opportunity to preach to different crowds, you end up many times, you, you develop favorite illustrations. And I can just imagine that all over Israel, Elijah, or Elisha had told the story of watching that chariot come and take away Elijah and, and of him saying, oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So the king comes in thinking, I'll pacify the old man a little bit. I'll pat him on the head, showing that I, the king, I even remember that story. I think he was nostalgic, not repentant. He gave lip service to Elisha's ministry privately. But can I say to you, I don't think Joash ever hollered amen at church. I know there was no church. I'm just saying, when God's people got together, I don't think you were going to find Joash being one of the guys who stuck out as being in favor of what the man of God was saying. I think he was affectionate, but not resolute. In his life wasn't changed. He was just going through the motions. And Elisha recognized his heart. And that's why I, the Bible says, Elisha, the man of God, was wroth. He was angry. And can I say to you that your preacher has, has every right to be angry when he's told you and told you and told you when he's reminded you and reminded you and reminded you, when he's quoted the scriptures again and again and again, and you still decide you're going to go your own way, don't be surprised. But at moments, he may actually be angry. He was the king of the northern kingdom. Mostly idolaters had ruled. He was co-regent with his father for seven years, and then he was five years a solo king. But his desires were weak, his expectations were low, and his exertion was minimal. 
I've observed many an opportune moment in my lifetime. One day, many years ago, I was handing out flyers and announcing a revival meeting that we were going to have. <clears throat> and I had passed out flyers uh, up and down many streets, and I was headed back toward my house. As I walked along my street, I noticed that my neighbor across the street, who was a construction man, had his pickup, and there were two or three other pickups parked up on the grass. And then I saw that he and about seven or eight other construction workers were out there. Apparently, for whatever reason, they, they weren't working that day. It was a nice day. It was a nice weather. But they were, they, were, they were just lounging around the outside of the house. Some of them were just kind of leaning up against the side of the house, you know, like just, just, just taking it easy. They had some beer, and they were, they were guzzling their beer there. And I thought, those guys don't want to hear about a revival meeting. <laughs> but I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me, go over there and invite those guys to revival. So I walked up with my flyer in hand, and I said, hey, I just wanted to catch you guys and tell you all about the revival meeting we're having at church, invite you to come. I started handing those flyers to each one of those guys. Most of them were quiet. They didn't say a thing. When this happened, I was about 24, I guess, 22 years old. One man was standing next to his pickup truck, and the pickup truck was door was open. He reached back up into his pickup, and he grabbed a rifle. And he pulled that rifle off, and he said, what do you think I got this for? Now, the preacher, the revival, or the, the revival preacher that we were having in was a black man, a great friend of mine. And on the, on the poster was, a, was his picture. And that man reached back there and grabbed that, that rifle and said, what do you think I keep this for? I had never, ever dreamed that anything like that would ever happen. I had no opportunity to prepare for it. But I believe the Holy Spirit of God gave me the answer for that man in a moment of time. It was the opportune moment. And, and just as quick as he had said that, I said to him, hey, you come down to the church. If you want to, you can sit right up on the platform, but I'll guarantee you he'll shoot straighter than you can. He shoots no blanks. He goes up no blind alleys and no dead-end streets. I went on home. None of them came to the revival. About 20 years went by. We were invited to come back for a anniversary of our church and we went back there my wife and I were talking and Sharon had witnessed many times to the wife of the man that owned the house I had attempted to witness to, to him several times so Sharon said I think I'll go back and talk to Lonnie again and she did and that day she led Lonnie to Christ. I tried to witness to her husband again, but again, I got a no. Another 10 years went by. I am not sure. It might have even been 20 years that went by. And again, we were going back. Again, there was an anniversary. Again, we thought of the neighbors still not saved. So we went. Sharon went to talk to, I, I don't think that's right. I don't think Sharon was there that time. I went, I went and I, I spoke to him. Maybe, maybe Sharon, were you there? No? Okay. I, I thought I knew this story better than that. But I sat in the living room with her husband. He had oxygen to his nose. He'd already had several bouts with cancer. He was not expected to live long. And I sat with him and I said, it's been 20 years since I've seen you. It's been longer than that since I lived across the street. This may be your opportune moment. This may be the last chance you have. And I explained the gospel to him. Sharon had led his wife to the Lord, but he was still a holdout. And so I, I talked with him that day, prayed with him. 
And I got ready to leave. He said to me, I, I said to him, I said, remember that day when I was handing out those flyers, inviting people to the revival? Oh, yeah. He said, I'll never forget that. I said, uh, what do you remember about it? He said, you remember the guy that grabbed his gun? I said, sure do. He said, he's in prison right now. Another man had bypassed his opportune moment. Dear Father in heaven, I pray, touch our hearts to realize that every one of us have opportune moments. Almost daily in our lives, we have opportune moments to make choices about doing your will and seeking to follow your leading in our lives. Lord, I believe that probably tonight there may be people here who still have doubts about their salvation and maybe not sure whether or not they are saved. Help them to realize that this may be their opportune moment of a lifetime. Others have other decisions, and I pray, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of your people. Help us, Lord, not to be like Joash was, just sort of sentimental. Help us not to be like he was, but help us to be resolute, determined that we will do the will of God. While our heads are bowed, I'd like to ask you to stand as we prepare to sing the song of invitation. As we stand for this invitation time, God speak into your heart right now. Is there some decision? Is there some individual that's on your heart? I told you that story because I wanted you to know that you can't win them all the first time. And 20 years later, you don't win them. And maybe another 20 years goes by and you still don't. But that doesn't mean that we quit. We need to keep talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you come and pray for someone that's on your heart tonight? And if you do not know for sure that you're saved, would you come and take the pastor's hand and tell him that you need to trust Christ tonight? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. What a wonderful message. Is this an opportune moment for you to make that decision for Christ? Will you not make that decision tonight? need to be saved, need to be baptized, need to be added to our church, or dedicate your life to Christ, surrender to Him, whatever it may be. I want you to come as Rick sings this next verse. Make that decision, would you? Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood and cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Well, let's sing this next verse together. No one else comes, we'll close. Let's sing as Rick leads us. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, Many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Well, I want you to be seated as uh, Pat and C.T. go back and get ready. Um, we're going to see him baptized. And so if he'd go back, Joe, you want to go back with him? If you would, Lisa, thank you very much. And Pat, several weeks ago, made public profession of his faith in Christ. Uh, some of you, were, I'm sure, were here on that Sunday, and now he's going to be baptized. Actually, the reason C.T. is going to do this is uh, C.T. and Sharon bought their house. And so uh, in buying their house, witness to them, and uh, Pat got saved. Isn't that a wonderful story? And uh, so he's going to be baptized tonight. And I rejoice. And I said to C.T., why don't you baptize him? You've been involved. And, and uh, so I was, you're preaching tonight. What a wonderful opportunity. Pat said, what a great opportunity to do that. 
His uh, wife's right over here. God bless you. We're happy about, about uh, and I know you are, about past decision. And uh, we rejoice in that. A significant moment in time. Uh, you have an opportune, an opportune moment where God gives to you. That's a great message. Wonderful message. Wonderful story. Uh, and uh, wonderful content in that for all of us that we have the opportunity to uh, shoot the arrows. Uh, it may seem like a waste to you to do what the preacher wanted, the prophet, the man of God. It may seem like a waste. Seem, what's, the, what's the use of all of this? Well, there's some things spent in preparation that need to be done. And uh, so a great, that's a great passage of Scripture, one of my favorite passages for all of us to recognize the opportunity that we have. And we rejoice in that. Uh, Dave, where are you at? Where's Dave Burke here? Dave, all right. Tomorrow night you have a you have a new group that's never been here before, right? For the Heritage Builders and having a wonderful meal. Um, so uh, that's uh, at six o'clock the meal starts. So great time for Heritage Builders. Can anyone not in that group fake it and come anyway? Uh, if they're younger than that, okay, all right. Just checking. Just wanted to know. So if you want to hear some. Some good southern gospel music, and uh, that'll be tomorrow night. Lots of things going on. Next Sunday night, Joshua Berkey is going to be speaking for us. Josh in, uh, and Joel, of course, uh, born here many years ago. <laughs> How many years ago has it been? 31 years ago. I'll never forget. Dave called me. My wife answered the phone 31 years ago and put me on the phone and and said, my wife's going, we're going to the hospital. The baby's going to be born premature. And I said, I'm right behind you. And I hung up, went back to sleep. My wife said, get up. If you're right behind him, you better get going. I said, yes, ma'am, I need to. And uh, those boys have uh, been uh, wonderfully used of the Lord. And Josh is the youth pastor at the Metro Baptist Church in the uh, Nashville. Is it Nashville? Yeah, Nashville area. Uh, wonderful church, great ministry there, and so he'll bring the message next, sun, next Sunday night. We look forward to that. You know, you cannot imagine your rope holding how many lives have been influenced by this Temple Baptist Church. Uh, people in the ministry, uh, just uh, some of them I hadn't even, hadn't even thought of. Dave saw a guy some, some years ago. He said uh, he's in the seminary. He said, you may not know this, but I got saved in your bus ministry many years ago, and he went off and moved away and, and got involved, surrendered to the ministry and was studying in seminary, but uh, had gotten saved in our bus ministry. You never know the impact of holding the rope of uh, the moment of opportunity that you have. And so uh, God bless you. I only have one question for you, Rick. Have you ever swallowed your Adam's apple? Is that, uh, that's, a, that's a great. <laughs> There's got to be a story of why it's called Adam's apple. I don't know what the story is. Why don't we sing a verse or two or something? What are you going to sing there? Let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing, yeah. amazing Grace. All right. Everybody knows it. It is Amazing Grace, isn't it? All right. And uh, as soon as they're ready, then we'll see them baptized. All right. Let's join together. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I How proud. 
couple of pages over, uh, 246, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It, and certainly that's a good thought when you're preparing for baptism. Let's join together and sing this. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. to have the opportunity to baptize and thank you pastor for this opportunity uh, Pat and his wife Anita who is here tonight uh, sold us their home about a year and a half ago and uh, so we began getting acquainted at that time uh, but Pat had had a friendship with another neighbor and uh, I, I want you to know that that other neighbor Don Hester is his name actually prayed with Pat when he trusted Christ. I didn't know all of that at the, at the beginning, but as we got acquainted,